welcome to the Black History Now live series. My name is Amity Pei, Chief of Communications at Color of Change, the largest online racial justice org in the country. This week, we will be joined by Dr. Afia Mbilishaka. Um, she is a therapist, an educator, a research scientist, hair historian, and a hairstylist. And she's the owner of Mata uh, Psychological Services, a private practice in Washington, DC, focused on promoting balance and restoring order to the lives of her clients. Um, she focuses on understanding and using traditional African cultural rituals for contemporary holistic mental health practices. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, she studied the psychological differences of race within the lives and earned a PhD in clinical psychology from Howard University at the age of 26. Dr. Afia has innovated the practice of research of psychotherapy, which uses hair as an entry point for mental health services in beauty salons and barber shops. Uh, she has been identified as a subject matter expert by the Senate and the House of Representatives, testifying nationally on behalf of the Crown Act, um, which is an anti-discrimination law um, to protect black hair. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amity. I'm so excited to talk with you. This is exciting. <laughs> You know, hair discrimination by educators is like a gatekeeping tactic um, that violates the economic and civil rights of Black people. Um, and we're, so we're really wanting to move away from that Eurocentric beauty standard um, and the sort of that must be reflected in the policies and of, of employers who have responsibility to uphold, you know, commitments to equal, equal opportunity. Um, and so I just wanted to start off by talking to you about, you know, the impact on education of Black youth in the ongoing hair discrimination issues that we see in the classroom. Can we start there? Yes, we can. Um, hair discrimination impacts Black youth at a multidimensional level. Um, we can think about how Black youth feel unsafe to express their identities in school hair is a big way that we communicate who we are and if that's regulated and actually a point of discrimination how can children feel safe mm -hmm. um another part of the experience of black youth with hair discrimination is poor interpersonal relationships with their peers and with their teachers um, teachers and peers can actually become bullies to black children in terms of regulating their hairstyles and hair statements um, and can actually become agents of oppression um, through these techniques. Another factor I would say that it justifies disciplinary actions for just having a black aesthetic mm -hmm. um, in school. And so some of the language that's even included in these dress codes and policies reflect the criminal justice system in disciplining children related to hairstyles. Um, this, again, does not make children feel safe enough to learn um, and can actually make them question themselves um, and just, yeah, it distracts people from learning, right? If you're worried about getting in trouble for your hairstyle, how can you focus on school? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we hear the horror stories in the news all the time, right? As a student valedictorian gets, you know, their their graduation is um, under threat because they won't cut off their dreadlocks or, you know, students aren't allowed to wear braids to, you know, to school. It's it's crazy. It's like this is the way our hair grows out of our heads. Um, and I think the work you're doing is so important. What uh, you know, I guess every woman, uh, I would say every black woman in our country probably has a story or knows someone close to them that has this kind of story. How do you see that play out in your work? Wow. Yeah, I'm glad that you're bringing all black people into this and women in particular, because every day across this country, black women and black children, um, and black girls and black boys and black men are policed in terms of our hairstyles, these policies at work and at school. Um, really impact whether or not people can have access to jobs, education, housing, all of that. Um, it creates this level of stress. We can call it hair stress, right? In terms of thinking about this double consciousness that we have to have how we feel about ourselves versus what will be seen as acceptable by larger society. Um, this sort of public versus private regard related to acceptance. It's just very <laughs> stressful to have to navigate that plus all the different factors of life altogether. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it seems like a level of stress that not all communities are, are having to deal with, right? No, no. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of research studies that have come out saying that Black women are um, 80 percent more likely to be sent home from work because of a hairstyle that they have or feel like they can't wear their natural hair to an interview. There's a lot of data coming out even for Black girls experiencing hair discrimination as early as five years old in school. And so this is across the lifetime. Well, so, you know, as part of this series, we're really talking about how education can impact these type of issues in our life. You know, um, how, how have you seen that play out? You know, we're, we're talking about changing um, the law is so that Black history can't be taught in school. How does that, how does it connect? Talk me through it. Okay. Well, it's interesting because I do identify myself as a hair historian. And I'm very mindful that um, a lot of information about ourselves are not included in our learning experience. Um, when we think about what education is, it's truly learning about ourselves and others. But oftentimes things that are relevant to us that we like to talk about, like hair, are excluded from uh, classroom discussions. Yeah, when we think about the importance of uh, learning about history and even hair history, that it really locates us, right? History, um, if, if I were to paraphrase um, John Herrick Clark, really helps people to tell a story of where they are and what they are, but more importantly, where they still need to go. And when we were remove some of those historical conversations, whether it's about hair or other things, we lose an, a sense of identity and sense of self and a timeline, a cultural historical timeline to understand and contextualize who we are. Yeah, absolutely. I think an essential aspect of equitable education um, really requires that school children, and I would say especially Black school children, um, they've got to feel included um, and bringing their whole selves into the classroom. But that means the classroom has to reflect their whole selves. Right. Um, and so, you know, part of our work um, to ensure that black history remains taught in the classrooms um, is is really focused on that. Right. It's not just, you know, Martin Luther King or like these big so, sort of well celebrated heroes. It's it's the nuance of all of who we are, I think. And so couldn't agree with you more on that on that piece. Can you talk to us about um, the ways that teaching Black history can actually support school age children? You talked about like the stress that sort of not being um, acknowledged and accepted brings like what's the what's the other side of that of that picture? Yeah, I, I love all things history. As a professor, I give such an in-depth um, introduction to psychology, talking about history and Black history in particular, because I feel like it teaches students courage and problem solving, right? In terms of when we look at the stories of these historical heroes, that that we have to understand their starting point. How did they overcome, explore, confront, disrupt what was going on in society to be able to problem solve? And so I think that sometimes we um, assume that they had the answer automatically or things came so easily. But when you study uh, biographies in particular from a historical lens, you can see how they had to organize, had to have community, um, maybe failed quite a few times. And so um, there are different scholars like Dr. Amos Wilson, who says we shouldn't do hero worship for our, you know, these people in history because that can sort of separate us. But to understand that there were people like us and went through struggles, I think that's a big part part in terms of perseverance um, mm -hmm. and to be able to, to address and solve the problems that were occurring at particular points in time. You know, there's an interesting thing you're having me think of is, is you know, if we're not teaching this as part of regular curriculum, like the historical pieces of it, if people are, if students aren't seeing themselves reflected, then when they get kicked out of school because their hair is is not you know professional or when something happens in the modern day it probably it, we've seen this is it's much more difficult um, for students to stand up for themselves to know what they should expect from our current society as well yeah there there has been pushback on these hair policies in school i'm thinking in particular where uh, whether it's zaleka patel in south africa whose school books policy said um children could not wear sh 
afros or twists or braids to school. And this is in Africa, right? And so how she organized 20,000 people to fight this biased school policy. And so I think that, you know, as we study historical figures, we can see how to problem solve in modern day times, even related to hair discrimination. Yeah, this is not, sort of not repeating the problems of our past, but actually moving forward with them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Understanding what still needs to be done. Yeah, well, that's the, let's, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about what still needs to be done because, um, you know, we're seeing a regression in our school system, but also in a lot of ways in our society for around accepting difference, but particularly, uh, you know, Black women uh, and men often can be the sort of target of that regression. And so um, what are you seeing in your work? Um, how How are we... What do we need to combat right now? Mm, okay. Well, since a lot of my work focuses on um, hair and psychology, I'm still thinking about the importance of the Crown Act. So the Crown Act stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And at this point, there are still about 30 something states where it is legal to discriminate against a child in school. Like really sit and process that over 30 something states in this country, you can actually tell a kid they can't participate in sports or go to the prom or go to graduation because of a hairstyle, a natural hairstyle that they're wearing. So I think that there's still tremendous work that needs to be done in terms of passing that. But then I think once the Crown Act is passed nationally or federally, how does it get enforced, right? Um, Dr. Amos Wilson also says that these laws are only as good as those who the laws that can be enforced, right? And to recognize that there's still significant trauma or hair trauma or aesthetic trauma that happens um, for children in schools and how to address that emotional aspect of their educational experiences. And I think we're still really behind in addressing the emotional needs or of the whole child, especially for black children. And so I think that that's where my work sort of leans into how to best support and process um, the racial cultural dynamics of this country. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I mean, hearing you, both you and I would not be allowed you know, into sports. If we were in school, it's like with our hair like this, it's sort of, it's ridiculous. And, and also I think, um, you know, more and more I've been thinking that like professional black women um, who are leading in the in the field right now um, and in this work are actually the examples that, you know, how you wear your hair is not, you know, is not a reflection of how successful you can be. And so I think that point that you just made is so important. Um, yeah, I, I wonder what what you know, you, you talked about enforcement. Enforcement is always hard. I will say, you know, color of change. We do campaigns around a whole range of issues. Enforcement is the name of the game for criminal justice reform, for voting rights, you know, for culture change, like we're, we're talking about here. Um, what do you what do you think enforcement looks like? I think a lot of people are worried that it would, you know, it would mean sort of policing students, but also parents and teachers. What what is like a, a positive view of that enforcement look like? Yeah, I think enforcement includes accountability, right? If we're saying that this is the standard, that you cannot discriminate against a child for their hairstyle, and it's happening, what are the consequences for that? And how is someone held accountable when they have wronged a child? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I still think that this country is behind in protecting children, right? Physically, emotionally. Um, but to actually think about how to scan and evaluate the bias that exists in these policies, right? To say this is or isn't hair discrimination, I think definition is important. Um, and also I I'm thinking about the importance of education because unfortunately there's intergenerational transmission of trauma related to hair too, that there are acts of racial acceptance and rejection that happens through the hair care process. And so to even think about um, the people who are agents of hair discrimination are oftentimes maybe experience it themselves, especially when we look at some of the HBCUs or um, black schools that are, have these bias policies as well. So I think that there needs to be some healing work um, that to disrupt this 
intergenerational transmission of straight is good and curly, coily is bad. Yeah, it feels like we're in a in a hair moment for a black community. You know, it's like braids are in style. Our natural hair is in style. Um, but uh, I'm curious about psychotherapy. You're talking about healing. Um, and, you know, it, even the examples you gave are ones I have experienced in my life, for sure. I'm, one, I'm wondering what, what, where can folks sort of start on that healing journey? Okay, great question. Well, I do want to de define what psychotherapy is. Uh, <laughs> so psychotherapy is using hair as an entry point into mental health care. Mm -hmm. And so what I've been doing as this, um, in this stage of psychotherapy is training hairstylists and barbers in mental health first aid. So actually help <laughs> folks identify what various signs and symptoms of mental illness are in communities of color. I teach a lot of techniques on active listening because I think sometimes, you could challenge me here, <laughs> I think sometimes stylists and barbers want to automatically give a solution or an answer to a problem and aren't fully listening. But when you are heard and listened to, it is so therapeutic. I think that was a lot, the hardest skill I had to learn as a psychologist to really listen to people because we're taught not to process and listen in certain ways, but even then um, getting into how to refer to mental health professionals. So just understanding, again, the psychology of hair, but making it in these spaces that are sacred and safe, which are the barbershops and hair salons that are sort of even outside of the educational experience or work <laughs> career life, but places where people can go to be taken care of and sort of let their hair down, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that just to clarify that um, we can really do healing work through our hair and especially our hair care rituals where we're really taken care of by someone else very gently and in, a, in an affirming way. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's like both at the at the salons, but also at home. Like those, yes. I, I've been, I watch all those long hair care tutorials <laughs> on YouTube. I feel like they can turn into ritual that are really self affirming if if you choose to make them that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. I definitely even train influencers, right? Because their messages meet millions of people and to think about if they are emotionally intelligent and psychologically sophisticated in their messages how that can have such a huge public health impact um, mm. as we engage in deeper self-love with black aesthetics yeah so one of color of changes sort of core initiatives is to center black joy mm -hmm. in everything that we do um, cause you know, in, so in racial justice work, we're fighting a lot, you know, we have, you know, we're, we're challenging problems, trying to make the more world a more human, less hostile world for black people. I'm curious, um, where you find joy in this work. Ooh, I love getting my hair done. <laughs> I love getting my hair done. It's interesting. Even the way, um, that psychotherapy came to me was because of my love of doing other people's hair. I was that girl in my dorm room doing everybody's hair, like the, from athletes to my friends. Um, and so actually psychotherapy was even born in my college dorm room because of the joy that I had around hair care. Um, I remember talking to my aunt Brenda on the phone one day, she's now an ancestor and telling her, I love psychology but I love hair. And so she said, well, why can't you do both? Now, I don't think she was telling me to do both at the same exact time, but that's the way I interpreted it and thought, hmm, I can do hair and therapy together. And so I found this joy by marrying my passions mm -hmm. um, that I didn't have to choose one, that I could do both at the same time. And so recognizing that um, it's a creative art for me to actually braid someone's hair, twist someone's hair, curl someone's hair. And so that's where I fit, find a lot of joy. Mm, I love that. I love that. Centering joy is always super important. I wanted to take us back to talking about the classroom a little bit, right? Talk a little more about the ways that our joy is sort of interrupted there. Um, we, we talked earlier about the ways that education can sort of uh, decenter the cultural influences that sort of make students who they are. How do you see that at play? Where does that come? Where does that actually come into practice? 
Mm, yeah, right now I'm thinking a lot about the language that's used in school um, related to hair and even hair discrimination. All right, I'm gonna say there's the other N word, nappy. Nappy, right? In terms oh. of <laughs> the other N word, in terms of thinking about how language at school um, can manifest this sort of aesthetic trauma. So, in some of my research studies, I've collected data using something called the guided hair autobiography. So the guided hair autobiography elicits stories from earliest memories of hair or low points or even peak moments. But I notice in the data that both peers and unfortunately, even teachers and administrators use the N word at school, mm -hmm. the, the other N word dappy in terms of positioning children in a way to question their own beauty. Um, so on the playground or in the classroom setting or um, talking about athletes and things like that, using um, that that other N word as a way to um, it's not only a microaggression, right, a way to invalidate someone's sense of self or make them question themselves. But it's quite violent, right, in terms of using a term that was used to dehumanize African people when they were enslaved in the Americas, right? That, that even the language um, or the use of the word nappy is, you know, uh, comparing um, people to animals or making their hair seem like fur or wool, which, you know, was used towards our ancestors. And so that is still perpetuated in classroom settings. Um, just like other curse words or um, racial slurs. And so we don't always think about how phenotype, right? The appearance of our skin color, our hair texture, our facial features are so attacked in school that it makes us more quiet, um, distances us from our peers or educators. Um, it's quite silencing and shaming. Um, in some ways. Now, there are people who are reappropriating the term, but I'm also mindful of the, the stories that I've been exposed to in the data that people never wanted to go back to school after somebody said that or yeah. beg their, their parents for a, a, a straight hair because of the level of embarrassment that, that they felt from that word alone. Yeah, absolutely. You can picture a student, you know, hearing that from an administrator who's maybe not targeting them directly, not speaking about them, but speaking about black people or black blackness in general, the phenotype, as you said, and, as, and ascribing whatever is being said to themselves. Um, and, you know, to your point about reappropriating terms for ourselves is like, uh, children can't always do that, right? It's like, you know, if you're in a playground, you know, reappropriating a term is pretty hard when you're like yeah. six or seven, you know? And so I think I think you're right is like holding ourselves to a higher standard when it comes to our children um, is really important. Something you said made me think about um, just culture, sort of culture, um, how culture is built in yeah. schools, right? Um, so often, you know, we get the stories about Elvis being the king of pop, right? Or the king of rock and roll, but we don't get all that background of like how that culture was actually created. Um, and I wonder um, if the same could be said for hair, right? Is we've got, we've got uh, sort of cultural fashion movements in the US when everyone was perming their hair, but there wasn't a sort of reconnection of that phenotype back to um, sort of black women and, and men. Um, and so just wondering if you've delved into that at all. I'm super curious about culture at Color of Change. Yes, yes. Well, I like to use Dr. Wade Noble um, as someone who defines culture and psychology. Um, mm. He says that culture is a design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. And so as a hair historian, you're having me now think back to these different cultural moments where hair and beauty was defined within um, social justice movements and political ideology, as well as education. Um, we know that um, in the 1960s and 70s, people went from being called Negro in color to Black and African. And with that change in consciousness, they had a change in their aesthetic, right? We know the humongous, beautiful Afros. And with um, 
people growing their natural hair out after it being straightened or wearing these wigs, that it really shifted a political and cultural movement, um, that there was an act of defiance to have natural hair and big, bold natural hair. And with that change in consciousness, we would hear the phrase, black is beautiful. Mm. Black is beautiful. I love saying that term. Black is beautiful because it had to be repeti- there had to be repetition with it. Because before that or during certain eras in the United States, that black was not considered beautiful. And so I think that, you know, one of the great things that the Black Panther Party did and other groups was to really redefine what beautiful was and it was being yourself. It was not Um, trying to conform to white ideals of beauty of long, straight, blonde hair, but to be your most beautiful Black and African self, having braids. And people started to research and uh, get have all cornrow styles and the colors and the beads and all of these different things to adorn ourselves and enhance um, our existing beauty versus having to change it. So I'm just going into Mm -hmm. that. But even um, you have me thinking about... uh, For certain organizations in schools, whether it's a sorority, that they actually would have comb tests, right? That if you your hair could not easily go through this comb, you could not join a certain sorority or extracurricular activity at schools. And so to even think about how hair has been used as a a way to divide black people, but also unite us as well. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't want to get all the aunties in trouble. I would stay away. I don't, I, I, what I'm thinking is like, um, you know, it's no coincidence. I don't think that uh, the natural hair movement in the United States, at least, uh, has really grown since 2014 when Black Lives Matter kicked off. It feels like a parallel um, mm-hmm. between, you know, the civil rights movement and Black is Beautiful sort of narrative that came out in the 60s. And now we have Black Lives Matter and a natural hair movement um now and present um and just wonder if you've been sort of following that and and seeing connections there yes yes it's it's interesting because hair is a complex language system it can really tell where someone's from their political ideologies their age their career we can tell so much about someone based on their hair and i think when people want to have a revolution they go to the root, right? They go to, they want revolutionary roots. And so that this expression, even thinking about the past two and a half, three years of us wearing these masks, we could still see hair and how uh, volume (laughs) of hair could really speak and uh, communicate to other people. We have a top-down processing, right? And I like to say (laughs) this phrase that Africa always comes back every four to six to eight weeks, depending (laughs) on the process. Africa is going to come back. So regardless of what you do in terms of straightening your hair with chemicals or heat, your your ancestry will return. And I think Even braiding, people, right? <laughs> yeah. Even braiding every four to six weeks. <laughs> yeah. So I think that people just um, as they, they again, focus on, on change um, mm-hmm. of elevating black lives and stories that um, there is that language of expressing your ancestry through your hair. Yeah, I think this brings me maybe to a place we can wrap is just what would it look like for our young, you know, black people and brown people in our country to really be able to sort of um, claim their history, to get to the root in that way, in in supported ways, right? Supported by their education, supported by uh school where they spend a a good deal of their time, but also by their communities. And so I I think we can close with that question for you is like, what is, what's the vision here? Okay. Imagine a world where hair care professionals were allowed into schools. Um, I'm, I'm picturing barbers holding classes Uh, about how to actually take care of your hair and teaching students how to give a haircut to their peer or, you know, going through that process. Imagine a world where hairstylists, um, instead of maybe having a home ec where we learn some, you know, life skills, but actually coming to school and teaching students how to care for their hair, using the language, using the products, hair health, um, right? I know in health class, I only learned maybe don't eat junk food and don't get pregnant. But imagine we had (laughs) hair care professionals talking about how to actually take care of hair and not damage it 
based on you know these pressures from society. So actually learning from experts throughout uh, various disciplines um, and even having mental health professionals teaching class. I know I never learned anything about mental health, anxiety, depression, anything like that mm. in school, but actually including um, these experts to come to these spaces and interact with our youth so that we can actually disrupt the trauma that happens in that space. Well, I can imagine it. I w I'm ready to get there. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> that plus language changes and the yes. teachers of, yes. you know, affirming students in class instead of kicking them out. Like, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, all, all of the above. Yes. Yeah. Please, please include educators in terms of these prep professional developments to actually learn the psychological significance of hair and hair care for black and brown children. Imagine that world. Yeah. Yeah, I would see our students, our young people thriving even, you know, more uh, with that level of support. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Afia M. M. Billy Shaka. It's been so great to talk to you. You're such you're such an expert. I'm glad that um, one of your your friends was able to challenge you to bring these two pieces of, <laughs> of your passion together. It's just so important and powerful work that you're doing. Um, really hoping that everyone who is watching can both support your work and also the sort of movement to, um, you know, t teach Black history in the public schools. And um, there are lots of ways that you can get involved. The Crown Act is still around and you can sign petitions and also call your legislators to help and make sure that you are not living in one of the states where this type of discrimination is allowed um and legal um and um you can also tell your stories storytelling is so important dr fia is there anything else you think folks should do or can do themselves to sort of join this movement that we're building i would say on the most basic level compliment a black child's hair <laughs> on a most basic level and to recognize that the the path to having healthy hair is having strong roots